Hey, my name's Jeremy, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Shelter Cove. And I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in with us today. I firmly believe you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be inspired, but most of all, that God's going to do something through this message that's going to move you closer to Jesus. Thanks again for tuning in. Go ahead and grab your message notes and your Bibles and meet me in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. One of our ushers will get one to you in just a moment. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I serve as one of the pastors here. It is so great to have you joining us today. I want to give a shout out to those in the loft, also those joining us online. So glad that you're tuning in with us today. Before we dive into the uh, uh, passage today. I just want to share with you a few things that are, are on my heart. Uh, in fact, turn to your neighbor on the count of three and say one. One, two, three. Good. What, what, what we're starting tomorrow is we're going to start a church-wide prayer effort where we are praying for the one. Somebody in our life, one person, we're going to pick them out, whoever they are that doesn't know Christ, and we're going to start tomorrow praying at one o'clock for one person for one minute that they would come to know Jesus. And then what we'll do is we'll bring them to the Christmas experience and they'll hear the gospel and pray that maybe God uses that, but we wanna be a church that is a praying church. So one person for one minute at one o'clock starting tomorrow and I'm just gonna be uh, in awe of what God does when we gather together and we pray for that one lost person in our life. We've got little stickers that you can put on your watch at one o'clock, uh, so when you see it on your watch, on your phone, you know, put them on your forehead, whatever you gotta do, remember, all right? But we got some stickers at the guest service uh, area, that, so don't miss out on that. And here's, here's why, again, I just wanna reemphasize why we do what we do. We are doing the light show because everybody that goes through the light show will get an invite to our Christmas experience service. We do our services so that you can bring your friends or family members that don't know Christ. That's why we do what we do uh, here at Shelter Cove. So don't miss out on that. Second of all, uh, how many of you uh, received the letter from myself, the year-end letter in the mail this last week? Uh, several of you. If you didn't, maybe you'll get it Monday or Tuesday. If you're not, on our mailing list. I wanna encourage you to sign up for that. We have extra letters, uh, again, at the guest services department right there in the ministry mall, and really just shared where we're at financially year end. Uh, normally, we enter this uh, time of year in a deficit, so this is uh, not strange, this is normal. But there's also some things that we want to do. We want to provide uh, baskets uh, of just blessing for teachers all throughout Modesto. We want to do that for like 20 different schools. We're going to help uh, 50 pastors in another country and, and help them with their development. But we also want to fund $30,000 because we're praying and planning on launching a campus Next year sometime, we believe that there's uh, more shelter coves that are needed in the Central Valley. So we are praying, planning, strategizing about that. So read the letter, and uh, I just want to thank you in advance for prayerfully giving a gift, uh, a one-time gift above and beyond your normal giving. Before we dive into the Word of God, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we pray for that person in our life that doesn't know Christ that you would use us, that you would use our prayer efforts. God, we take time and we're gonna pause every day at one because we believe it makes a difference. So God, would you move in our hearts in this Thanksgiving and Christmas season? Move in our hearts right now as we open your word. Change us, inspire us, challenge us to be the people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First Peter chapter five, let me just set the stage of what's taking place. We're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Last week we looked at five ways to finish well. At the end of chapter four, it, Peter talked about suffering well. And he realizes that for us to suffer well as followers of Jesus Christ, there need to be leaders that are Christians that are encouraging that are loving, that are supporting, that are shepherding people in a time of hurt, a time of pain, a time of heartache. Why? Because there's so much persecution going on in the life of the church. And so he's gonna write in five simple verses what effective church leadership looks like. Let's stand as we honor the reading of God's word. First Peter chapter five, starting in verse one. Peter writes, so I exhort the elders among you 
as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You may be seated. You know, I believe one of the most profound, powerful, brilliant creations in all of history is the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And here's why, with two simple pieces of bread and two elements, you can create something that is oh so satisfying. Now, how many of you put the peanut butter on first? Raise your hand. All right, how many of you put jelly on first? Raise your hand. A few of you, all right? We've got some sinners in the house today. Let me just make sure we all know how to properly make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, all right? You get the two pieces of bread out, you get out the peanut butter, you wipe the peanut butter on one piece of bread, and if there's excess peanut butter, what do you do? You wipe it on the other piece. You don't lick it off yet, all right? You gotta wait. You wipe it on the other piece, you clean off your knife. Now you are dealing with a clean knife. Then you go into the jelly jar. You wipe it onto the other piece of bread. Now if there's excess, what do you do? Ah, right? You lick it off. Two simple elements, but oh so powerful. That's what we're talking about today when we look at leadership. To simplify it, It's two elements, but when we get this down, oh, it is so powerful. Now don't miss this, Peter's writing specifically to church leaders, to pastors, to elders. But these principles that we're talking about today, they apply to every single one of us, why? Because as a follower of Christ, you are called to influence others. It doesn't matter if you're a mom, a dad, a sibling, a friend, a grandparent, a boss, a teacher, it doesn't matter. All of us have people in our lives that we are called to influence as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so godly leadership come down, comes down to two simple things. And we're gonna start with the peanut butter because that comes first. Number one is who you are. What's the first key to godly leadership? It's who you are. Why? Who you are will impact everything that you do. What's going on inside your heart will eventually be exposed. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we letting into our lives? What are we listening to? Who are we surrounding ourselves with? Because the key to godly leadership is who who you are. And there's several different titles uh, that we're gonna see in the scriptures for this, this position of leadership that Peter's talking about. He's, he's gonna talk about uh, elders. What, what were elders? Elders are, are the spiritual leaders of the church. Another name for them is overseers or bishops, which often focuses a little bit more on the administrative side of church leadership. We also see uh, uh, shepherds or pastors. That they're all the same thing, similar functions. Uh, again, pastors provide the care, uh, the love, the support, the leading, the guiding, the teaching for the church. And that's the context, but again, we can apply these principles to every single one of us. It starts with who you are as a spouse, as an employee, whatever God has placed you to be a godly leader, we have to think about who we are. And he's gonna break that down a little bit deeper in two different ways. Number one, he's calling us to be spiritually mature. He's calling us to be spiritually mature. And boy, before I even say anything else, I, j- I just want to say that I am I'm so thankful for the, the elders, the pastors that serve here at, at Shelter Cove. They, they're just such a great, godly group of people. You are, you're truly blessed by, by the elders and the pastors that, that serve here. Yeah, you can, you can clap and appreciate them. They're just, they're just a great, great group of guys. And this is what he says. He says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. I love this because Peter's not appealing as the apostle. 
He's not uh, calling himself the Pope. He's saying, you know what? I'm just one of you guys. I'm just one elder encouraging other elders. And what we see in scriptures, anytime there's elders in the church, there are always multiple elders. Don't miss this. We see this in Acts chapter 14. We see this in Acts chapter 20, where Paul goes and appeals to the elders, plural, of the church in Ephesus. So anytime there's, there's elders in the church, it's not singular, it's always plural. Why? That's God's design. A team will always outperform an individual. Why? There's checks and balances. There, there's, there's unity. There's camaraderie. You know, I think about our elder team, our elder board. Over the last eight, nine, ten years that I've had a privilege to be um, at the elder meetings, we meet once a month on Monday nights. Uh, I can't remember one time where we've had a vote where you just need a 50% majority um, where we haven't been unanimous. Why? Because as an elder team, as a leadership team, we believe that we have to be unified moving forward. Because if we're not unified, we don't, we don't want to go forward. Why? Because if we're not unified at a leadership level, we're not going to be unified at a staff level or at a church level. And so unity is so important in the body of Christ, especially at the leadership level. That's why moms and dads, it's so important that you're unified. Grandpas and grandmas, it's so important that you're unified. But he's, he's talking about just, just the, some of the reality of these elders. Back in the uh, Old Testament, specifically the New Testament, uh, a lot of the Jewish culture, you were considered spiritually mature or at least mature, old enough to serve as a elder when you were 30 years old. You were considered old. How many of you are at least 30 years old here today? Good, a lot of old people, right? According to the Jewish culture, just keeping it real. But it more had to do with your walk with God. How do we know that? Because the Apostle John was most likely in his late teens when he started ministry. John Calvin, great teacher. Charles Spurgeon, great teacher. They were in their early 20s, which would have allowed them to be an elder or a pastor at a young age. It's not necessarily the age. It's the reality that you're spiritually mature. It's it's who you are. And this is what it says. In Titus, chapter one, starting in verse five, we're gonna have the verse up on the screen. It says, this is why I left you in Crete, that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, I love that, above reproach, what does that mean? It means unquestionable character. First thing he starts with, to be an effective leader, to be an elder, to be a pastor. He says, above reproach, the husband of one wife and the children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Debauchery is just wild living, drinking, all of that kind of stuff. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. Hello, he says it twice. He must not be arrogant, quick-tempered, or a drunkard, drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy words as taught so that they might be able to give instruction to sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. He needs to be a godly man, man with healthy relationships, man of godly character, man that holds the word of God high. Well, how do we know if we're headed in the right direction when it comes to spiritual maturity? What questions do we need to ask ourselves? I want to give you three. You may want to write these down. Number one is, am I learning about God? Part of spiritual maturity is saying, you know what, I I want to know the one I serve. Am I taking time to learn about God. Why is this so important? Because in 2 Peter 3.18, it says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Am I learning about God? Spiritual maturity, number one. Now, let me be clear. that This is where a lot of people start, and that's where they stop. They learn about God. They understand who God is, but they don't drop to these next two because it's not just about how much God we know. It's about the fact, are we living for God? Am I living for God? Because you can know all the scripture in the world, but if you don't live it out, that's not being spiritually mature. It's not about how much you know. It's about how much you live out. Am I living for God? Paul said in Galatians 
Chapter two, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So am I learning about God? Am I living for God? And then thirdly, am I, am I loving like God? Am I loving others like God? Why is that so important? Galatians 5, 6 says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Through love. And so the first point is, is who you are. We have to be spiritually mature. And one of the great ways for us to keep growing in that is through life groups. It's through a pathway study, a lot of stuff that's going to be launching again in January. But second of all, in your notes, we have to be close to Jesus. Close to Jesus. How do you get close to somebody? Some of you single people are like, you sit next to them in church, right? No, wrong answer. That was supposed to be a joke and only three people laughed. That's all right. How do you get close to somebody? Talk to them. Spend time with them. This was something Peter did regularly. So you can't be spiritually mature without being close to Jesus. They're not two different things. They're two different sides of the same coin. And this is what Peter says. He says, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. He was close to Jesus. Peter's appealing to himself as somebody that, that knew Jesus, walked with Jesus, not just in the good times, not just for the three years when everything was going great. He walked with Jesus in the midst of his pain and suffering. When Jesus was being betrayed, when Jesus was being whipped, when he was being abused, and it doesn't say that Peter was there at the crucifixion, but most likely he was there maybe on the outskirts watching what was taking place. Here's a guy that knew Jesus, the good, the difficult, the challenging sides of Jesus that a lot of people never saw. Why? Because he was close to Jesus. By the way, do you have people in your life that know you? That way that they're so close, they've seen you in your suffering, they've seen you break down, they've seen you cry, so that they can love you. Here, here's Peter, he was close to Jesus. He also says a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. If there was somebody that knew a little something of the glory of God, it was Peter. Why he was there at the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, the glory of God was revealed. Peter, James, and John are invited to go up with Jesus on the mountain. Who else is there? Moses and Elijah show up. Jesus' face is as bright as the sun, the passage says. And there's this bright cloud that comes over. And what speaks out of the cloud? It's God himself who says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And Peter's saying, if that's just a little glimpse of the glory that I've received and experienced, how much more will it be when Jesus comes back? So the first part of being just a godly leader, it's, it's who you are. It's being spiritually mature and it's being close to Jesus. Now, there's this thing called emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is understanding who we are accurately in, in living out in a way that lives really well with others. It's, it's really having a good understanding, an accurate understanding of who we are. Now, there are a lot of people that, that think they know who they are, but that's not who they really are. So do you have people in your life that tell you who you really are? They love you that much where they wanna make you better, they wanna encourage you, they wanna make you the best person you can possibly be. One of the things I appreciate about the, the close people that I work with is that they're not impressed by me. Not one bit. The one thing they wanna do is make me better. And so they're, when I have blind spots, they'll tell me, now Jeremy, you need to rethink this. You need to rethink that. I'll ask, hey, is my thinking off at all? And there's some that'll be like, yeah, we think it is. But there's these checks and balances. Why? Because I wanna make sure the way I see myself is an accurate thing. Who you are is the peanut butter to godly leadership. Well, what's the jelly? It's point two in your notes. It's what you do. It's what you do. Two effective ingredients for effective leadership that's godly. It's who you are, and it's what you do. 
Now, long-term ministry, let's just be real, uh, just, just for a moment. It, it can be messy. It can be crazy. I've been accused of having selfish motives. I've been accused at times of uh, not being sincere. I've been criticized. Uh, but I've also made my share of mistakes. I've made, uh, I've jumped to conclusions. I've misunderstood people. And I love the way that Chuck Swindoll puts it. He said, ministry is imperfect shepherds leading imperfect sheep in the service of a perfect God who has a perfect plan. And so anytime there's people involved in anything, it's always gonna be messy. But in the midst of the messiness, in the midst of the need of grace, how do we live out this as leaders? What do we do? And Peter's gonna say five things. Number one in your notes is we care for people. We care for people. As a pastor, my responsibility is to care for the people. As a parent, as a grandparent, as a teacher, as a boss, your responsibility is to care for people. And this is what he says. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. I love this because he says, shepherd the flock of God. Your kids, who you are shepherding, they don't belong to you, they ultimately belong to God. The employees you have, they don't belong to you, they ultimately belong to, you, to God. This church... You, you don't belong to me. You ultimately belong to God. I was eating sushi down the street uh, earlier this week, and one of the waitresses came up to me, and she said, hey, aren't you the owner of Shelter Cove? And I'm like, you, well, you know. No, I didn't say that. I said, you know, I have the privilege to, to work there and serve there, and yeah, I would love to, to have you, you come and check it out. In fact, uh, I'm gonna go back this next week and bring an invite card, but, but anytime we think that we own something, <laughs> We're just off. Everything that you supervise, everyone that you lead, God has entrusted to you. And I think of all the animals that he could illustrate this with here in the context of the church, he uses the, the shepherd sheep illustration. And it's crazy because sheep are not the smartest tools in the shed, right? There are some crazy sheep out there. In fact, check out this video just for a second of this Sheep caught in a, ro uh, a tire swing. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. <laughs> all right, that's enough. I could watch that forever. That's just funny. That, that's just funny. But I think of all the animals. God's like, you know what, you're shepherd to, to sheep. Why, why couldn't he refer to us as dolphins? Because they're really smart. Or chimpanzees. Or cats. No, cats aren't smart. They have nine lives, right? They're actually really, really foolish. But here's the reality. To shepherd a flock, it's a difficult task. Why? Because sheep need to be led to water and food because they can't find these themselves. Sheep must be kept quiet and calm in the midst of a storm. Otherwise, they can get frightened, they form a stampede. Shepherd must pull out the poisonous weeds when sheep are gazing, why? Because sheep will end up eating the poisonous weeds. They can't pick out the healthy food from the, the poisonous food. Sheep have no way of protecting themselves. If they're being chased by a wolf, they eventually will get devoured. And here's the crazy thing, a sheep can roll over on its back and is unable to roll over again. And if not helped, it will die. How many of you knew that? Once a sheep is on its back, it can't roll back over. Some of you are like, I'm gonna go push over a sheep today. Don't do that, all right? But, but here's the crazy thing. In a very simple way, Peter tells us, shepherd God's flock. Well, what does that mean? I wanna give you two simple words. And these are the words that Jesus gave to Peter. Peter had denied Jesus three times. He was down on himself, and God comes up to Peter and says to him, hey, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times to remind Peter, hey, I know what you did, but I'm a God of grace, I'm a God of forgiveness, I'm a God of second chances. I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you've blown it in some area of your life. God is giving you another opportunity today like Peter to get right with him. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Tend my flock. Peter, do you love me? He emphasizes again, feed my sheep. Two things shepherds do, feed and tend. Two words, write those down in your notes. Feed and tend. See, when, when we're born, 
We need somebody else to feed us because we're not able to. We need somebody else to give us a bottle, give us food. Then we get to a point in our lives where we are able to feed ourselves. And then we get to a point where we are able to feed others. The same is for us spiritually. There is a point in our lives where we don't know like anything about the Bible, we just need somebody else to feed us. Then we get to a point where we are reading the word of God and we are feeding ourselves. And then we get to another point where we are feeding others. Maybe we're writing down crazy notes from the message and we're saying, man, do you know what God's doing in my life? And we're telling people and we're leading life groups and Bible studies and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because Jesus said, Peter, feed my sheep. The second thing he said was tend. What does it mean to tend? It means to guide and it means to protect. It means to guide, in in other words, lead them in the right direction, but also protect. Why? Because there were always wolves that were seeking to devour the sheep. There are so many people that call themselves Christians. There are so many pastors that are really nice guys, but they're a bunch of phony balonies. And so my responsibility is to make sure that you are learning and living out the word of God. The first thing that we need to do is care for people. Second thing we need to do is lead with passion. Because we, we, we need to lead with passion. Again, he's talking about church leaders here. Can you imagine what it would be like if I just didn't care about my job and I didn't want to do it? This is what it would sound like. Uh, go ahead and get your Bible and open up to First Peter. Wouldn't that be horrible? You'd probably all pray for the rapture, right? It'd be horrible. No, he's saying, hey, if I've called you to do something, do it with passion. Do it with excitement. Do it with enthusiasm. This is what he says specifically. He says, exercising oversight. In other words, pastor, leader, don't do it all yourself. And we see this a lot of different times in scripture. What do we see in Exodus? We see Moses is getting burned out from dealing with all the problems of the people. What happens? Jethro's father-in-law says, hey, you can't do it all. Build teams of people underneath you so that they can help deal with all the problems. We see this in Acts chapter six. What happens in Acts chapter six? There's so much of a food ministry going on to the widows, which is great. The apostles didn't want to neglect the teaching of the word of God. So what do they do? They look for spirit-filled men that would help with the feeding of the widows so that they would not neglect the teaching of the word of God. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. I love that, not under compulsion. In other words, we're not doing it because we have to do it. We're doing it because we want to. We do it because there's a calling on our life. We're doing it because God has put people in our life and we want to give God the absolute best. He says, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not for shameful gain. Well, well, how would a pastor do it for for shameful gain? If they, let's just be real practical. If, If I was doing this because of how it made me feel. If I was doing this just because I wanted to make money. If I was doing this because whatever reason. Any reason that's focused on me and not God would be shameful gain. And why was he saying this? Because there were probably pastors that were doing this. There's pastors that do this today, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Two words in your notes, write them down. Motives matter. Motives matter. It's not just about what you do, it's about why you do what you do. I wanna say that one more time. It's not just about what you do, but it's about why you do what you do. Motives matter. Motives matter, and I love this because the simple reality is lead with passion. Part of passion is just caring about people, listening to people. I love our our pastors, our elders here at Shelter Cove. They do such a great job of listening to people. I'll see our our elder team, our pastoral team in the ministry mall just, just talking. You should, should never, ever have a time here where you say, you know what, I, I wanted to talk to somebody, but, but nobody would listen. It's one of the reasons why I want to stand in the ministry mall in between the services at times because I just want to make myself available. We'll listen to you. We'll love on you. We'll pray with you. Lots of times you give us uh, some great feedback that's really great to hear. There are times where we do get feedback. It's written on a letter, a note, no name signed. Those go right in the file drawer. You know what the file drawer is? The garbage can, right? 
But anytime there's, there's names written on it and, and there's, there's feedback, boy, we always want to listen well because we want to lead with passion. What's our passion? It's you. It's Christ. Thirdly, what do we do? We model Christ. We model Christ. Now, now before I jump into what Peter says here, how many of you are parents or grandparents? Raise your hand. Good. How many of you have friends in your life? Raise your hand. Good. Um, Here's the reality. What do your kids, grandkids, friends need to see? They need to see Christ in you. Why? For many people, you are the only Bible they will ever read. That's it. They're never going to open the scriptures. You're the only Bible. And this is what he says. He says, not domineering over those in your charge. Now, why would he say that? Probably because there were some pastors that were doing that. Sadly enough, they maybe had an ego. They were prideful. They were selfish. They were domineering. He's saying, I don't want you to do that. What do you do? But being examples to the flock. Why is it so important to be an example? Because more is, is caught than taught. Before you want to be something, you need to see something. Don't miss that. There, there's something powerful uh, about even Paul who said, follow the example, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. It's modeling Christ. Again, parents, grandparents, the, the greatest thing our kids can see in us is the example of Christ. One of the things I want for Drew, and he's my 13-year-old son. I tell him this all the time. I say, son, the one thing I want for you is to grow up, and I just want you to love Jesus with all your heart. That's it, so I'm, I'm try to find ways where I can help him, encourage him, train him, and model for him what it means to, to love like Christ. And so I, I told him a couple weeks ago, I'm like, hey, buddy, go upstairs and pray for your mom. She had her ear surgery. She's doing pretty well, by the way. And um, just go pray for her. So he goes upstairs and he prays for his mom. And later that night, Kelly's like, hey, did you tell Drew to come up here and pray, pray for me? I'm like, yeah, I did. I'm just trying, to, just trying to help him. Well, a couple days later, he went up and took the initiative. I didn't even ask him. And then a couple nights later, he took the initiative. I didn't even ask him. And then I told him, hey, son, next time when you pray with somebody, touch them. Touch mom's arm. Touch your hand. I told him, hey, a couple weeks ago, dad was at the hospital, and there was a man that couldn't even talk. And I I reached and grabbed his hand, and you know what I did? He held on to mine. And I said, son, there's something powerful about when you pray for somebody and you touch them. And so that night, after I've been, I've been telling him this for a couple weeks, I reach out and I touch his shoulder. And he's, we're getting ready to pray. And he looks up at me and he touches me back. And I'm like, okay, he's, he's getting it. That's my junior high boy. I love it. I grab him. Ah, dad, I got you, right? But you, you model it. Why? Because before people can be something, they need to see something. That's one of the reasons why Christ came to this earth, so he could model for us what it means to live a holy life. We we have to be people that are modeling Christ. Fourthly, what do we do? We aim to please Jesus. Aim aim to please Jesus. Here's what I've learned um, doing ministry for almost 20 years. If I try to please people, I will always disappoint people. I will always disappoint people. If you are a teacher and you are trying to please parents, you will always disappoint parents. If you're a parent and you're trying to please your kids, you will never always please your kids and you will also be miserable. And so we have to be people that are aiming to please Jesus. So the question is, is who's your audience? Who are you trying to please? Because if it's anybody but Jesus Christ, we will find ourselves severely disappointed and we're missing the point of what we're doing. Our whole goal in life, whatever it is, whether it's leadership or something else, is to live a life that pleases Christ. That's how we worship him. And this is what Peter says. Aim to please Jesus. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I love this shepherd. That's who Jesus is. I'm the under shepherd to the chief shepherd. In other words, I am living a life where I am accountable to Jesus, the shepherd. He's called the good shepherd in the scripture. Why? Because he laid down his life for the sheep. He's called the great shepherd. Why? Because he actually rose from the grave. And he's called the chief shepherd. Why? Because he's coming back. 
And he's who we give our lives to. He's who we are accountable to. But not only that, he's, he's the one that we model our lives after. Don't miss that. See, to be a great leader, you have to be a great follower. To be a great leader, you have to be a great follower. See, we are simply shepherds that are living a life modeling the chief shepherd. Aim to please Jesus. What's the goal? The goal is not to please everybody in this life because we can't. The goal is to stand before Jesus and have Jesus say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. And not only do we seek to aim to please Jesus, but lastly in your notes, what do we do as leaders? We practice humility. We practice humility. I believe that this is the key not to just leadership, but I believe this is the key to the Christian life. Why? Because pride, don't miss this, keeps us from heaven. Pride is somebody that says, God, I don't need you. I can do it on my own. Pride says, I'm better than others. Pride says that I'm, I'm sufficient, I'm self-sufficient, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good person. You know what humility does? Humility sees ourselves for who we really are. Sinners in desperate need of a savior. People that, that, that desperately need God. People that, that can't do anything ourselves, but everything that happens in this life that's good and powerful and pleasing is only because of the grace of God. So to practice humility, and, and this is what he says. He says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. I, 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 like, I love this. Especially in our culture right now, he says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. What what's he's saying here is that we need to live lives of submission to the leadership in the church. Now, again, this doesn't mean that we can't disagree. We can't have strong opinions. Some of the people that are closest to me are people that wrap their arms around me and say, hey, Jeremy, have you thought about this? Or I thought about this. Or why is the church doing this? Always in a loving, caring way that I know is for me and the church. But in order to live out the scriptures, you have to be plugged into a local church Otherwise, you can't live this out. And we have a culture that says, hey, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to be plugged into the church. You can't do that because you have to be under the authority of leadership in the church. Not that the church leadership is always going to tell you everything that you want to hear. And I know people that bounce around from church to church to church to church because there's something that the pastor did or said or a decision that was made that they didn't like. No, being under the authority of leadership, especially in the church, involves great humility. Hebrews 13, 17 puts it this way. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be no benefit to you. He says, clothe yourselves with humility. What was he thinking about? Most likely he was thinking about the night before Jesus died on the cross when Jesus got down on his knees because that's what his slave did. And he put on the apron, the apron of humility, and he washed the disciples' feet. See what happens when we lower ourselves. We lift up God and we lift up others. Peter remembered that. Peter was modeled that. Jesus has called us to be humble because he was humble. Godly leaders, godly leadership. What's the peanut butter and the jelly? It's who you are and it's what you do. If we get those two simple realities right, God will use us in a powerful way. So here's the, here's the final question I wanna leave you with today. It's simply this, what do I need to surrender to God? Ask yourself that question, what do I need to surrender to God to be the person, to be the leader that God wants me to be? Maybe you haven't surrendered any guilt and shame in your life because of past sin. 
Maybe you haven't surrendered an area of your life because you're holding on to it. Maybe you haven't surrendered your schedule, your time, your calendar to God. And you're saying, you know what, God, I want to keep control of my time instead of saying, God, here's my time. Here's my calendar. Wherever you want to use me, use me. God, here's my gifts. Here's my ability. Here's my relationships. Can you imagine how different our lives would be if we surrendered every area to God? who you are, and what you do. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, that's great, but I've never even surrendered my life to God. If that's you, in just a moment we're gonna pray and I'm gonna give you the opportunity to make the greatest decision you could ever make. It's the starting point by surrendering your life to Jesus and receiving his free gift of salvation that will guarantee you eternal life in heaven. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for perfectly modeling the leadership we talked about today through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we're all flawed. We all make mistakes. We're all sinners in desperate need of your grace. And so in the midst of that, today and moving forward, would you use us? God, what area do we need to surrender to you today? We want to identify it and we want to do it. Right now in the quietness of your heart, if there's an area of your life you're holding on to, it's affecting your leadership, it's affecting your influence, would you give that to God right now? With all heads bowed, nobody looking around, you're here today, and honestly, you have no idea where you're going to spend eternity, because you've never taken time to get right with God. The Bible says that all of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of God, and there's only one remedy for the sin in our life, and that's Jesus Christ shed blood in his resurrection. If you're here today and you want to be saved from your sin and know that you're right with God, tell Jesus that in your heart. You can say a prayer that goes something like this. It's not the words of the prayer. It's the attitude of your heart that goes, dear Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Forgive me. And I pray that the rest of my life would be the best of my life. With all heads bowed, nobody looking around, if that's you today, would you just raise your hand and look at me? I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. If that's you today, just raise your hand wherever you're at and just look at me. Say, you know what, that's me. Up in the loft, if that's you, just raise your hand. Good, I see that hand. Is there anyone else? Greatest decision you could ever make. Awesome, I see that hand as well. Is there anyone else? Say, I just want to be right with Jesus today. Awesome. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the hands that were raised and the hearts that were changed. Help us to live lives that were, we were all about you. Lives that are surrendered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, church, we had a couple people that gave their lives to the Lord. Can we just appreciate those people? Hey, if, if you gave your life to the Lord, a, a couple things. If you just go to the table out in the ministry mall, right outside those uh, double doors, there's a prayer table, and write, write down your decision on a card. You can do that even on the response card in the chair in front of you. Um, or your gathering card, but then tell somebody, because we want to help you follow up on your next steps uh, in your walk with Christ. One more time, can we appreciate those that gave their life to Christ today? (laughs) Hey, don't miss next week. We're wrapping up our First Peter series. It's going to be absolutely awesome. God bless you guys. Have a happy Thanksgiving.